Please turn to the Word of God to the book of 1 John. 1 John in your Bible. Now, that's not the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but it's John at the back of your Bible. There's the place to look. And if you don't have a Bible, it would be great if you could look on with someone who does have a Bible with them this morning. I don't mind you if you're using a Bible on your phone this morning. Some of you maybe use the Pew Bible inside, or if you forgot your Bible, and uh, I'll take it that you're not looking at scores or something like that, but you're paying attention in church. But we're in 1 John, and we're going to be primarily in the book of 1 John. If you're not used to being in a Bible and somebody's showing you a Bible, just follow along. There's chapter divisions. You'll be able to pick up what verse that it is that we're looking at. And some folks have been raised in church, and others have never been in church. And so whatever your story, we're glad that you're here and appreciate everybody being faithful. And again, we do want to make sure that we give close attention to the Word of God and try to focus in here this morning. I was torn and about what it was that God would have for us today from His Word. It's a big Bible, 66 books. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, and they're all good. And there's just plenty of great, wonderful things in the Word of God. The Bible is inexhaustible. You can just read it over and over and over and over, and it continues to speak. And it's a living book. It's the words of God. And so when we open up the Bible, we want to give it reverence and respect and let it speak to our heart. And you say, well, I don't even know if I believe the Bible. Well, it's good that you're here because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so the more you get into the Bible, the more the Bible will get into you, and the more you'll be able to learn the Word of God and get from it what it is that you do need. And we all need the Bible. There's nothing wrong with America that could not be fixed by the Bible Amen. and in the sense of practicing the Word of God. And our country's a mess because we've gone away from God's Word, and we need to give it a revival of attention. And so as we're pondering this morning. I, I had a, uh, a message and I was pondering this thought and went to something, and, and, but the Lord's directed me back here. And it's, it's not a message that I would kind of like to preach right now in the sense of I'd, I'd love to just get up here and preach a message about Jesus and shout it out and have a great time. And uh, this would be a great environment to do that. It's a, it's a little bit of a sober thought, but it's not meant to be a discouraging thought. It's meant to be a challenge from God's Word. We've been preaching about, talking about, teaching about, speaking about the idea of revival. And revival brings change. And there's no doubt about that. Revival is necessary. You know, we've gotten so sophisticated in America. <laughs> revival, as if, you know, that's just what some radical crazies that meet under tents do. Uh, you're one of those today. But the idea is this, we need revival. If you can't figure it out, our country's in trouble. We are going the way of ancient Rome. We are crumbling because of our sin issues and because of a lack of God consciousness. Sadly, there's not gatherings all over South Jersey where there's a bunch of people meeting. There are some churches where some still gather, but a lot of people are doing a lot of other things with their time as compared to giving God our attention and our focus. So thank you for making the choice to be in church. I'll pray here from the pulpit. And then we're going to dive right here into the message, into the Word of God. I'm distracted right now because my youngest daughter has my granddaughter waving at me from outside of the tent. Bring her in now. I pointed her out. Hurry up. Run over. Let's go. We got, look, see her waving? Look at that. How cute is that? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Hello, Scotty June. Hi. How are you, baby girl? How are you? Oh, it's so good to see you. And I know you want to come up here, but I can't. I'm, I'm about, this might be the shortest message you've ever heard at Solid Rock Baptist Church, right? I'm being drawn to the back right there. Oh, Lord, Lord, let's help us. Father, I pray you would help me and help us. And Lord, thank you for the sunshine, and thank you for letting us be here. God, there's people here, you know this, they don't know you through Christ. They've never been saved. I pray you'd show them their need for salvation. For all of us who are saved, Lord, I pray you bring revival. And you said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And Lord, we need healing and we need help. And I pray we'd be willing to turn from our wicked ways. And I pray with humility we'd come to you this morning. 
God, I pray you'd open up the word of God in our hearts, not just here on our laps, and I pray, God, that it would make sense. And we pray in Christ's precious and holy and wonderful name, and all God's people said, First John chapter 2 in your Bible, my little children, these things write I unto you. John the writer says, these things write I unto you by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that ye sin not. Now, if it's your habit to mark or underline in your Bible, I'd like you to mark those two words, sin not. Our goal, what we want to ultimately take away from this message is sin not. I just quoted 2 Chronicles 7, 14. A few weeks ago on a Thursday night and leading up to the tent meeting, it's actually been 10 days ago now, we went through 2 Chronicles 7, chapter, uh, chapter 7 and verse 14. We talked about in chapter 5, Solomon had the dedication of the temple and the glory filled the temple by a cloud and the, the people, the priests could not even minister Chapter 6, Solomon's prayer, he talks to the Lord and thanks God for all of his blessing and asks for his help. In chapter 7, God speaks to Solomon. And he said, listen, if I send a drought or if I send pestilence, now you think about it, we talked about this on that Thursday night, that would be a time where God was trying to get our attention. How many of you know God's trying to get our attention? God wants to do that. God wants us to focus on him. And in chapter 7, in verse 13, he said, look, I I may be sending drought at some point. I mean, just recently you were there and dedicating the temple, and I filled that place, and my glory was there. But if people get proud, if they turn away from me, I may have to send some things to get their attention. He said, if that happens, in verse 14, he said, if my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Now, today we call ourselves Christians. Everybody help me. We call ourselves what? Christians. And to be a Christian means to be Christ-like, all right, or a Christ follower. If my people, and I know that's for the Old Testament Jewish economy there in Second Chronicles, but making application for us living in America in the New Testament church age, if my people, which are called by my name, Christians today, shall humble themselves. And I'm not teaching replacement theology. For those of you who know what that is, I'm not saying that at all. I'm making application. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You say, what's wicked ways? Sin. Sin is our wicked ways. And God said if they will watch church, turn from their wicked ways. It means we're headed this way in sin. So, well, what kind of sins? Well, I'm not going to preach a whole sin list today, but I'll give you two major types of sins. Sins of commission, which means we're doing things we shouldn't do. Sins of omission means we're not doing things we should do. I'll repeat that. Sins of commission, things we're doing we shouldn't do. Sins of omission, not doing what we should do. And if we head along in our sin and God stepping in and trying to get our attention, he said, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. And I believe with all of my heart, under the tent this week, we've been seeking his face. And we've come here, including literally in a location not in our pretty building, but here under a humble tent to acknowledge, God, we need you. And we've come, God helping us with a spirit of humility and seeking his face. And this idea of turn from our wicked ways would be, there's going to be a change. Not just we had, oh, tent revival meeting, but that it brought about a change, which are humbling ourselves and turning from our wicked ways. God said, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. And in my spirit, I need healing, and so do you. In our families, we need healing and help. In our local church, we need healing and help. And no doubt, in this nation, we need healing and help from God. Church family, please hear me. Guests today, we need God in this nation. And the church is to be the conscience of the community. Christian people are to be the salt. We're to be the light, and we're to be making a difference. But we can't be making a difference if we're no different. Did you hear me? We can't be making a difference if we're no different. God's people are to be distinctively different from people that are out here in the world. Now, we have commonalities 
Thank God I love cheesesteaks. Hallelujah right there. All right, put your thought on lunch and then bring it back. Reel it in. Here's the thought. There's certain things that we do. I love oxygen. I'm breathing it like every other person in South Jersey right now. But here's the thought. Listen, I'm not the same in the sense of I'm a Christian, and as a Christian, I'm to live differently. So here, John says, my little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. Simply put, God does not want us to sin. Now, we're going to jump around in 1 John, and if you have your Bible, keep going with me every time I give a reference. 1 John chapter 5, let's get a good definition of sin from the Bible. 1 John chapter 5, and if you're looking on with somebody, just pay close attention to it. 1 John 5 and verse 17, the Bible says this, all unrighteousness is sin. Do you see that? So righteousness are the things that are right. But all unrighteousness is sin. So in the Bible, some things are distinctly called out as sin. All right? Thou shalt not steal. Stealing is a sin. So we should never steal. The Bible definitely says that. There's other things in our modern world. The Bible does not say distinctively, thou shalt not look at internet pornography. But let me let you know very clearly that would be sin. And the verse would be Psalm 101 and verse 3. David said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. So whether it's specifically stated in the word of God or the biblical principle for, we are not to be part of sin. And all unrighteousness is sin. So again, the goal is, 1 John 2, 1, sin not. Now, please hear me on this. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. I'm going to preach a message that's primarily to people who have already received Christ as their own Lord and Savior. But if you've never done that, that Bible word saved, that is your need, okay? So the idea of, well, if I stop sinning, then I get to go to heaven. And if my good works outweigh my bad, then I get to go to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches, The Bible teaches all have sinned, and the wages of sin is death. And what that means is we're all sinners, and as sinners, according to the Bible, we all deserve hell for our sins. Well, I don't believe in hell. Well, you got to take that up with Jesus, because he preached more about hell than he did about heaven in the Word of God. And hell is a real place. Yeah, it's South Jersey. No, South Jersey may have issues, but it's not hell. Trust me. And here's the thought. Listen, as a sinner... All of us are born with a sin nature. You don't have to teach us to sin. My little granddaughter out there, as pretty as she is, as cute as she is, there's times when you tell her to do something, she'll look right at you and go. (laughs) You say she's one years old, but she's got a sin nature, and it's already surfacing, all right? It's like her grandmother. And um, I'm only kidding. Uh, But the thought would be sin nature. You don't have to teach a kid how to sin. They know how to do it. Oh, you don't understand. Yeah, I do. Go to the nursery. If we could live stream in right now, be 20 toys there, right? That kid could go to any one, but he wants the one that that other kid's got. And they just crawl over to him, right? And put their teeth right on that other kid's arm and hunk, take a chunk out. My kid, I've never been here before. We, no, we'll protect them and, uh, from the other kids. But here's reality is selfishness. Where does this come from? Sin nature. We're also sinners by choice. We know what's right and wrong, and whatever percentage of the time, we choose wrong. And God watches all of that, and God knows that we deserve punishment for our sin. The punishment we deserve is hell, and that's what I deserve, and that's what you deserve. But thank God, God does not want us to go to hell. And the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That means this, God gave Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. That whosoever, you could put your name right there in the verse, believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We don't get to heaven by what we do for God. We get to heaven by putting our faith and trust in what God did for us. God gave Jesus 2,000 years ago to die on Calvary's cross, and we get saved when we put our faith and trust in Christ 
alone. It's not Jesus plus joining a church. It's not Jesus plus being good. It's not Jesus plus putting money in the offering plate. It is Christ alone who saves. And if you've never been saved, you need to be saved. That's your need for forgiveness. After you're saved, we begin on this journey of the Christian life. So positionally, when I got saved, I was sanctified. Everybody help me. What's the word? Sanctified. What's that mean? It means set apart. I was positionally made clean by the blood of Christ. And when he sees me positionally, he doesn't see me as a sinner. He sees me as a son. But in the practical living out of my Christianity, what we could call a practical sanctification, setting apart, a progressive sanctification, I personally have a responsibility to do what 1 John 2, 1 is teaching, sin not. I have a responsibility as a Christian to make a choice post-salvation. Again, if you don't know Christ, your need is salvation by Christ alone. In our sanctification, it also is by Christ alone, but we have our personal responsibility. What I mean by that, it is Christ who empowers us to live a sanctified life, which means to be set apart from sin. And here's the problem in America right now. Watch this. Fools make a mock at sin. That's what the Bible says. Fools make a mock at sin. You know, you could not go into a comedy club in New York City today without hearing the so-called comedy just mock a bunch of things that are ungodly and, and just the whole idea of sin. People laugh at it today. No big deal. Please hear me. It's still a big deal with God. All sin is a big deal to God. And God's saying here, here's my standard. I want you to sin not. And if we're truly having or going to have revival, it will bring about a change in our behavior, in our actions, in our attitudes. It'll be changing the way we feel and changing the way that we think. So Christ saves. 1 John 5, 1, notice it, please. And then I'm moving on from this thought, but in 1 John 5, 1, whosoever believeth, that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. So the idea would be you're saved by believing in Christ. But once you're saved, you should live differently because you've been saved. Thought, simple, but follow it. Are you all too warm back there? Is everybody in that corner? Are you all cooking like microwave? Are you good? I'm getting thumbs up and other people saying I'm cooking, all right? I, I, don't, I don't know what to do about that, all right? Y'all perfect back in that corner, or you're good? Or is it Luke's, Luke's cool? All right. That's because Gabby put her thumb up, and he has to do whatever she tells him. Um, I'm only kidding, kind of, Luke. Uh, notice here. Here's the thought. Are y'all ready? Say people do not have to sin. Say people do not have to sin. Now, that doesn't mean we won't sin. But God gives us the Holy Spirit on the inside. And God's given us the word of God. So we're imperfect, but the goal is sin not. So you may sit here and say, well, I think I'm perfect. Well, you're not. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8, look at it. 1 John 1 and verse 8. And would you read it together with me out loud? Ready? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Brother Charlie, that's a good message, but I don't think it applies to me because I never sin. Um, you're lying in church, all right? If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. Follow me. If you think, well, I don't need the message, you're deceiving yourself. Because we all need it. We don't have to sin, but at times, because of dealing with flesh, the song says, the arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. The apostle Paul said, the things I don't want to do, it's what I end up doing. The things I want to do, I don't end up doing. And then he said, oh, wretched man that I am. Has anybody ever been in the wretched man ministry and understands what I'm talking about right there? We want to please the Lord, but at times our flesh fails us and we sin. So what are we going to do when we sin? Well, look at 1 John 1, 9. 
You are there in eight. It proves we are all sinners. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we sin, we should confess our sins. Please hear me. Keep a short sin list between you and God. Don't let your sin build up. Keep a short sin list. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says this. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Michael's up here with the others and they're singing about the mercies of God. Man, I'm glad for the mercy of God. If I cover my sin, come on, y'all know what that's like, right? The kid, you know, did you eat the cookies? No, right? Chocolate all over their face, lying like a rug. And I don't even know what that means. But the idea would be, listen, he that covereth the sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Let me ask you a question. What are you trying to cover that God already knows about? May I remind you, you can fool me. You can fool anybody in your family, but you cannot, feel, you cannot fool God. There's no sin that's not uncovered to God. And it's a foolish attempt to cover sin. Instead, we should confess sin. And the goal is sin not. Everybody help me. The goal is sin not. First John 2, notice it. If we do sin, we can confess it. We can forsake it. I love this. First John chapter 2, notice verse 1. My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. Notice, and if any man sin. So the goal is sin not, but if you do sin, oh, I love this. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You know what an advocate is. It's a go-between, right? It's someone that will speak for you. We have an advocate with the Father. I love the song Brother Mike and the others sing, Mercy Walked In. And man, that idea of I'm in the courtroom of sin, I'm judged guilty, but thank God, mercy walks in. And I'm glad for the Lord Jesus Christ, hey, when I've sinned, I have an advocate, I have Jesus Christ who goes in and speaks on my behalf. You say, well, what does he do? Notice the verse, verse two, chapter two and verse two, and he, Christ, is the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation means satisfactory payment. Hey, I'm a sinner and I ought to go to hell, but thank God the blood of Jesus Christ washes away my sin. And now that I'm saved and I'm a child of God as I'm journeying at times, if I were God, I'd get rid of me. But thank God Jesus speaks for me. And when I have my sin, thank God I can confess it and his blood, that propitiation, that satisfactory payment, I can be forgiven of my sins. So again, we don't have to sin, but when we do sin, we can get forgiveness of our sins. Here's my question. What sin do you have in your life right now unconfessed? What's in my heart, what's in your heart, where the Holy Spirit knows about it? We were feeding people after the services, our guests and some others that came in, in the coffee shop. And a couple of the nights there, when, when they were all done there, I was, I was taking the broom and sweeping out the coffee shop. And my mother, who's over here, she taught me how to clean. So when I do clean, I feel compelled to go all the way to the corners and to move things and to sweep the thing out the right way. So the table that's in the corner table there, I start to sweep near it and could see a little bit. And then I tip that big marble table up that there is in the corner. It's been there since we started the church. And underneath of that were all kinds of treasures <laughs> of dirt and food and slop. And I got under there with that broom. I was cleaning it out. It was not easily just seen by, if you look, oh, it looks pretty clean. But underneath in that cover-up place, there was more there. May I suggest God has a spiritual flashlight that can see the deepest, dark parts of my heart, and there's nothing I can't hide from God, and there's nothing you can hide from God. There's nothing I can hide from God. There's nothing you can hide from God, and we need to be careful. Watch, church. We need to be careful that we don't become insensitive to the sin. God wants it out. 
So we can get it confessed. We can get it right. Go, go to 1 John chapter 3. We talked about sin, all unrighteousness of sin. Well, look in 1 John chapter 3. Thanks for turning. I don't care if we pop up these other things back there, Brother Joe, if it's not distracting. Some of our people in these nice, comfortable lawn chairs in a really warm, cozy spot with the birds singing right now and, and just kind of going off in the la-la land while I'm preaching about sin. All right, come back to me. 1 John chapter 3. Come on now. And verse 4. Are you there? 1 John chapter 3. And all that was I was talking about Brother Mike. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Notice here. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Transgresseth also the law. For, help me on that last statement, ready? Sin is the transgression of the law. Do you see that? It means this, when we disobey God's word, we are sinning. Say that with me. When we disobey God's word, we are sinning. This side said it louder than that side. I'll give you a second chance. Are you ready? When we disobey God's word, we are sinning. So the thought is this, we don't want to disobey God's word. Sin is a transgression of the law. Here's what Brother uh, Thren preached. No, Brother Morrison preached. He said, the problem is not what I don't know. He said, the problem is what I know that I don't do. Y'all know the verse for that? Some of you, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So our problem most times is not that we don't know right. The problem is we know right, but then we don't choose right. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Hey, if you've got a Bible in your hand, some of you have been raised up in church, or whatever point you came into church, you've been learning the Word of God, question, and I'm asking myself, who are we to ignore God's Word? How do we expect to have the blessing of God in our lives when we know things from the Bible that we choose not to do. Where do we get the idea God's word is like a buffet line? You ever walk through a good buffet line? Shady Maple Ministry. Some of you been there in Lancaster County? Man, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to lose you now on lunch thoughts. But, man, you go down there, and there's this and that and the other. and You can just, and sometimes we look at the Bible like, oh, yeah, I'll take that because that talks about the joy of the Lord. But Brother Charlie's preaching this morning from the Word of God about sin, and eh, I don't know if I want that today. Where do we get the idea we can pick and choose to obey what parts of the Bible as compared to God hands it all to us and says sin is a transgression of the law. Don't disregard what I put in my book. And revival for Solid Rock Baptist Church for your family, for you individually, would be a renewal of committing to practice what the Word of God says. Well, Brother Charlie, it's 2024. Do you understand? Some of the things in that Bible seem extremely old-fashioned. It does not matter what the culture does. It matters what the Bible says. Are you with me? We don't need to be politically correct. Come on now. The church is not supposed to go woke. No, no, no. We're to go to the Word. I'm not going to what the world tells me is acceptable. I want to go to what God's word says is acceptable. And sin is this transgression of the law. We don't want to do that. Save people, obey God's word. Look in 1 John chapter 2, please. Thanks for turning. 1 John chapter 2. You allergy people cranking up right now. God bless you. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him. Everybody help me. I've got it circled in my Bible. What's that next word? Yeah. If. And hereby we do know that we know him what? If we what? Do you know one of the proof evidences that you're saved is that you choose to obey the Bible? The world today, they don't care about God's word. Man, if they don't know Christ, they don't care about doing what the Bible says. But if you say you're saved, one of the proofs that you have been saved is there's going to be a desire in your heart to obey God's word. I want to ask every person under this tent right now, how serious are you, how committed are you to obeying God's word? I'll be very direct. I'm afraid of a judgment where the Bible says God's going to have people come before him and say, Lord, we did this and we did that and we did the other. 
And God says, depart from me, I never knew you. And here's the thought. I don't care if you've quote unquote prayed the sinner's prayer 22 times. If you don't have the Holy Spirit on the inside, if there's no hunger for the word of God, there is something dramatically wrong in your Christian life if you're a Christian. And the point would be, as newborn babes, I'm quoting, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. These babies born into the families at our church this week, those babies from the womb, they instantly want to eat. You know why? They've had a birth. When you have a new birth in Christ, when you're born again, you're going to have a spiritual appetite. Now, I didn't say my Bible reading or Bible meditation has always been what it should be. It hasn't. But I can say consistently, I know I need the Bible, and I want the Bible. I want to hear it preached. I want to hear it taught. I want to meditate on it privately and on my own. I want to study it because the Bible is the Word of God. And if you don't have any appetite for the Bible, you better check out that you've ever been saved. People will sit and they'll watch a ball game three hours, not blink. People sit and they'll watch a movie three hours, not blink. But what about your appetite for the Word of God? We need to have a strong desire. The Laodicean church age, 2024, it becomes a carnal church, a worldly church, a fleshly church where we're no different than the world itself. God's people ought to be different. That's what God's called us to be. So the goal is sin not. Everybody help me. The goal is what? Sin not. Notice here, say people obey God's word. People who live in a pattern of disregarding God's word it's not even indicating you're saved. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3, notice, your obedience to God's word is necessary. Verse 5, but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. When you want to obey God's word, it's good evidence that you have been saved. Brother Ty, what degree do you think we should take obeying the Bible? Would you look in verse 6? 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. Would you notice, please? He that saith, he abideth in him. Okay, I'm a Christian. That's what you'd say. I abide in Christ. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also to walk. Well, how? Even as he walked. Who is the he? It's referencing Jesus Christ the righteous from verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. Walk even as he walked. So we said to be a Christian means to be what? Christ-like. Everybody help me to be a Christian means to be Christ-like or a Christ follower. You're to be walking as he walked. You say, how did he walk? He walked without sin. But child, you're suggesting I can be perfect. No, I already made clear from scripture we won't be, but we should try to be because that's how Jesus was. First John chapter three, would you look there? And verse five. First John chapter three and verse five. Thanks for turning. Notice and ye know that he, speaking of Christ, was manifested to take away our sins and, five words out loud, ready? In him is no sin. Aren't you glad that our Jesus is perfect? In him is no sin. And we read in 1 John 2, 6, that we are to walk even as he walked. So the idea would be this, I'm to be Christ-like. People wear the bracelet sometimes, WWJD, what, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, that's not a bad question to ask yourself. I'll tell you what he would not do, he would not sin. So what would Jesus do? What's right, which is righteousness, and all unrighteousness is sin. You say, man, this is a high standard, I know, but because we're saved and we are Christ-like, followers, if we are dependent upon the Word of God and the Spirit of God, God can empower you to live the Christian life victoriously. We don't have to live like the world. We can live with the victory, and we live it through God's power. Look at 1 John 3. Thanks for turning. 1 John 3, 24. Notice here, talking about the Holy Spirit. And he that keepeth his commandments, that's what we're talking about, obeying the word of God, dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us. How can I know I'm saved? By the spirit which he hath given us. Do you know when you get saved, the Holy Spirit moves in on the inside? So we have the word of God, and we have the spirit of God. 
The Holy Spirit will never lead you to live contrary to the Word of God. Are you listening? If you're really saved, I mean, I don't mean just you say you're saved, but if the Holy Spirit lives on the inside, He will never lead you to do something contrary to the Word of God. He will always lead you to obey the Word of God, and every one of us need a hypersensitivity to the person of the Holy Spirit of God. We're not to grieve Him. Yeah, I say, how do you grieve the Holy Spirit? By tolerating sin. It's literally the idea of it saddens him. If you think about it, Holy Spirit, the person of God, moves in at salvation. We are sealed permanently and dwelt with the Holy Spirit of God. He's holy. So it grieves him when we allow sin in our lives. God's word says, if I regard, Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. To regard means let it take root. Let me ask you a question. What do you let growing right now in your life right now that shouldn't be there? There's sometimes things that grow that are nasty. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? I looked on our counter yesterday. My wife's been incredibly busy with nursery and all the rest of a tent revival. And I looked there yesterday and I saw a banana bread that had been there last Sunday. And the banana bread was growing. And I looked at that, and I was grossed out under that nice glass case there, and I dumped right in the trash can. Phew. I didn't want to taste it to check and see. I didn't want to cut the growth off. I wanted to get it out of here and into the bag and into the dumpster. And I made sure that cake container thing went right over to the sink where we would make sure it got washed. You say, why? Because it was nasty. May I remind you, to God, our sin is nasty. To the Holy Spirit, it's offensive. To God, it is putrid. And the Bible says, like a dog returns to its vomit, which is so sickening, a fool runs to the folly of his sin or her sin. God says, hey, I want you to live no sin. Let's not sin. And that would be revival for our lives if we turn, church, from our wicked ways. Now, it could be sins of commission. I already told you, I'm not preaching the list. Things that you're doing that you shouldn't be doing. Let me ask you a question. What's God's Spirit pointing out to you right now that you should not be doing? How about sins of omission? What is it that you're not doing that you should be doing? Boy, God can just point those things out through His Spirit. Quickly, home stretch. We're to have victory. Look in 1 John 5. God's people are not supposed to be living defeated. We're to be victorious. Notice the words, 1 John chapter 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, right? So we get saved. Verse 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Notice that word, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We don't have to live as losers. We're to be living as overcomers. And God wants to do that in our lives. God wants to give us the victory. Now, we can live with an anointing. If you look in 1 John 2.20, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. It means this, we know what's right, and that unction is God's empowerment. Drop down if you would, and notice verse 27, 227, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. One is the person of the Holy Spirit, for sure. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. It means this, you know what's right if you have God living in you. You know what's right if you have the written word of God. It's not the problem that we're not knowing. The problem is that we're not doing. Or we're doing things that run contrary to the scriptures, and we need to get right about those things. So we are abide in Christ. We are not we are not supposed to be loving the world. Look in 1 John 2, 15. Here's where too many people who say they're saved are living. Pick up 2, 14. I've written unto you fathers because you have known, now if you're a father, you ought to pay close attention to that, that it is from the beginning. I've written unto you young men because you are strong, gentlemen, and the word of God abideth in you, gentlemen, and you have overcome the wicked one. Talk to me, verse 15. Ready? Help me. Love not the world 
Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Notice, I'll read 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Why are people who say they're God's people so in love with this world and the lust of this world? The lust of the flesh is the desire to do. Man, we want to go out and do what the world's doing. Lust of the eyes, boy, that's the desire to have. And we're here coveting and materialistic and obsessed with more stuff. The pride of life is the desire to be. We're going to promote ourselves. We have that pride that whelms up. That's not what Jesus did. And he is our model. And he is our pattern. And we are to be following and walk even as he walked. And we cannot walk like Christ if we're loving the world. We have to say no to the world. We have to say yes to the Lord. We have to say no to the world and say yes to the word of God. We have to say no to our flesh and say yes to the Holy Spirit of God. He wants us to have victory. Now I'm going to give you one thought in the context of what 1 John emphasizes when it comes to a sin that we should not commit and proactively what we should do that's Christ-like. 1 John 3, and pick up 14. 1 John 3, 14. Please, thank you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, which means we went from unsaved to saved, because, because we, what? Love the brethren. Wow. I said one of the ways you know you're saved is because you have a desire for the word of God and obey it. One of the ways you know you're saved is because you have the spirit on the inside. Church family, one of the ways you know you're saved is because you love the brethren. Do you remember when Jesus said, here's the way they're going to know you're a Christian, because you put a big sign out on the white horse pike? No. He he didn't even say, here's the way they're going to know you're a Christian, because you carry a Bible. Jamie, here's what he said. They're going to know you're mine by the way you love the brethren, the way you love other Christians. You know why it's so important that we come to church? The Bible says, Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together because it's an opportunity to love all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Church should not be a stopping point where you just kind of come and go and we're in and out. And all right, let's get to the diner. Let's get lunch. Let's get home. Let's whatever we're doing. We are here as a local church body. And Christ said, you're to love And it's one of the ways to know that we're saved. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 23. You're there in 11, 311. Look at 323. And this is his suggestion? No, this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And help me, church, what's it say? Three words. Love one another. Did it say as he gave us suggestion or does it say as he gave us commandment? Commandment, right? And Jesus said, you're to love each other and with a great love. Look at chapter 4. Might be on the same page, 4 7. Notice, beloved, let us what? Love one another. Why? For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Notice chapter 4 and verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. You know what revival looks like? Man, there's a turning from what's wrong, our sin, there's a turning to what's right. And the primary thing God's emphasizing in these verses we've just read, what's right is to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. So let me ask you this. Who are you bitter against? Who are you envying? Who are you jealous of? Who do you, I just don't like her. I, I just, she gets on my last nerve. Let me ask you a question. Who do you hate? Look in chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Here's what God says about that. 2, 9, he that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. You hate your brother, you better check out that you are a brother. Because the God, Bible says you're in darkness. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. and There's none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. You know what revival, you know what happens when 
You know what happens when revival happens? Here's what happens. People get right with each other. But Joe, people get right with each other. We're coming to the end of our revival meetings. You know how I would be really sure and confident that we were truly experiencing a touch of revival? If people who are not right with each other would get right with each other. Because I think we overlook. I don't know about you, but it's convicting when you think about what Jesus said and that here's the way they'll know you're my disciples, by the love you have for each other. And he put such strong emphasis, love the brethren, love the brethren, love the brethren. You know, to love somebody, you've got to be able to connect with somebody. You've got to take time to connect with someone. You've got to invest in someone. Well, I don't need friends. Well, number one, you do. But how about if a friend needs you? See, it's not just, well, how do, what do I get out of this? What's in it for me? No, that's a selfish mindset. It's not about me having a friend. It's about me being a friend, a Christian friend, one who has love in his heart. Two last sections, we're done. First John 3. Five minutes, are you ready? First John 3. How many believe Jesus is coming? Would you say amen? amen? I don't know when he's coming. It could be in our lifetime, maybe not. Personally, I believe we're in the last of the last days. That's my opinion. I don't have a verse. I don't have, I don't have a date that says, you know, July of 2024. But I do believe he's coming, and I think you do. Look in 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Isn't it an amazing thing? Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, and by the way, he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So we're going to get to see Jesus Christ. I've met some famous people, but that, let me just tell you something. There's nobody like Jesus. Amen. And every one of us who are saved, we're going to get to meet him in a good way. Sadly, if you're not saved, you'll meet him at the great white throne judgment. But if you believe you're going to see him, verse 2, we shall see him. Notice verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him, you really believe he's coming, here's what you do, and we have the hope in us, purifieth himself, purifieth himself. Now, what does that mean? It means I'm choosing to live a pure life. Purifieth himself, what standard for that? What level? Even as he is pure. So we walk even as he walked, and we have this command to purify ourselves. Are you listening to purifying? When the brides come down the middle aisle in their white wedding dress, they have been very careful to preserve the whiteness of that dress. They don't typically chug chocolate milk right in the church lobby before they go walking down. They don't say, hey, give me some grape jelly on my toast that morning when they're in the gown already. They are hyper-concerned about walking down with no spots on the wedding dress. That white speaks of purity. And the Bible teaches here that if we're saved, we should be choosing purifieth himself means, watch church, we have some personal responsibility. Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy 5.22, keep thyself pure, purifieth himself. I want to ask you a question. What are you allowing in your life that God's not looking at as pure? Where you need to make a choice to sin not. Question, what's in your home that doesn't please God? Uh, let me take it to the next level. I, I could climb the pole right now to get your attention on this one. Where are we not being as careful or demanding with our children and especially teenagers about what it is that they're able to look at, connect with through the internet, cell phones, etc., etc.? Are y'all with me? We're to be pure in our own person. We're to have purity in our home, and there's to be purity in the church. Purity. I ask you, what's in your heart that God doesn't like? The last scriptures we'll look at, 1 John 5. The home stretch here, notice this, 1 John 5. Two minutes. Verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. You know, one of the blessings of 
sinning not is that you get your prayers heard. As compared to what I quoted earlier, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. We have this idea, oh, we're in a pinch, we're in a tough time. I guess God needs to hear me now. We should be living where God can hear us all the time. Notice verse 20 and 21. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true. Man, if we're saved by God's grace, we're part of truth, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So we know we're saved. We're His children. 21, together out loud. Help me, church. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Would you look this way as I close? An idol is anything in your heart that you're putting above God. It's anything I put in my heart that I'm putting above God. John finishes out the book by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and says, keep yourselves. You know what that is? Again, personal responsibility. In my progressive practical sanctification, I have a responsibility to turn from my wicked ways and to sin not. And in revival... In revival, here's what God's people do. They get super sensitive to any sin and say, I don't want it. And they get super sensitive to anything doubtful and says, I don't want that either. When in doubt, don't. It says, if it's just a weight, it may not even be a sin. It's not helping me run my race, done. Father, I pray that you would help me to practice what I preach and sin not. God, I pray you give us revival. I pray you'd settle this crowd right now in our spirit. And in this invitation time, we would focus in on what you're trying to tell us. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Brother Charlie, I know I'm saved because of a Bible reason. I know I've done what the Bible says a person has to do in order to go to heaven when they die, in order to be saved from sins and saved from hell. There was a time in my life when someone showed me the scriptures. I made the decision to trust Christ and if I were to die, I know I'd go to heaven for a Bible reason. If that's you, and don't raise your hand because someone else does, but if you truly know that, would you raise your hand real high? I know I'm saved, and you can put your hands down. Is there anyone here with heads bowed, eyes closed? I'm not going to send someone to you. I'm not going to make you stand up. I'm not going to make you do anything you don't want to do. But is there anyone under this tent this morning? God brought you here to hear the message. And you'd say, I don't know that if I were to die and my heart stopped, I fell out from this chair, I'm not sure I would go straight to heaven. I'm not sure I've done what the Bible says and putting my faith and trust in Christ. And I have concerned about my soul and I would like prayer. Would you let me pray for you right now and give you an opportunity to trust Christ? Would you let me pray for you? Anybody right now, you say, that's me. I don't know I'm going to heaven. I'm concerned about my soul. Here's my hand. Would you raise it real high? I'm looking all around the tent here. Thank you. I see those hands. You can put them down. Who else? I'm not sure if I were to die that I'd go straight to heaven. I'm concerned about my soul. I see that hand. You can put it down. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I'll just ask one more time. I didn't raise my hand, but man, I should have. I'll raise it now. If that's you, would you raise it real high? I'll have prayer here in just a moment. I'm going to pray for all of you that raised your hands and said you're not sure you're going to heaven. We have, at the end of every one of our services, an invitation if you're not saved, you could come and somebody would take a Bible quietly and off to the side, show you from the Bible how you could be saved and it'd be the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. I guarantee it. So I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. But I want to ask saved people, who here would either decide for the first time or have a revival of this decision in your life? Well, Tal, I, I, I saw those scriptures. I know that I need to be obedient to the Word of God. I know I need to be yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. I know I need to be walking Christ-like in the way He walked. I know I need to be purifying myself. I know I need to keep myself from idols. And God's Spirit spoke to me as part of revival in my heart. I want to turn from any wicked way of commission or omission. And I want to have a renewed sensitivity to the Word of God and the Spirit of God in my life, and I want to live and practice this principle of sinning not. I want to practice that principle. If God spoke to you, and you'll try to achieve that goal day by day. Would you raise your hand? My hand is up, and many, many across this room. God, help us to live that. Maybe you're here and say, I tried that, 
I know I am saved, but I just feel like I'm away from God. Well, let me remind you of 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he'll forgive them. The Bible says he's faithful. And I'll speak as personal testimony. Although I have failed the Lord, he has never failed me. And if you'd come to God today from a backslidden condition, God would forgive you and you could be right with God. Father, I pray for those who've raised their hands and said they're not sure they're going to heaven. Oh God, I pray they won't leave here today without trusting Christ. I pray they'd make that decision. Please, Lord, give them courage. And Lord, for all of us who are saved, I pray that we won't just rush out without speaking to you about how you've spoken to us. And God, give us true revival, please. And I pray this in Jesus' name. We're going to stand to our feet. If you'd like to come and use the altar area, please feel free to do so. If God spoke to your heart, if you're physically able, would like to come and kneel here and seal this decision in your heart, feel free to come. If you don't know you're going to heaven, I have ladies standing here, men standing here. If you're a man, come to one of the men. A lady, come to one of the ladies. You could trust Christ today. Would you come? Would you come and be saved? Even if you didn't raise your hand, come on and be saved. If you're not saved. And if you are saved, would you do business with God? Would you do business with God? Would you say, God, that's my goal, sin not. When I do, I'm going to get it right, right away. I'm going to get it under the blood. But I want to walk as he walked. I want to keep his commandments. I want to have purity. Maybe a husband and wife here would unite together and say, let's have more purity in our home. Maybe some dad here needs to decide for his children. Man, we're going to, we're going to do the right thing. We need a revival of righteousness. All unrighteousness is sin. Pray right now. If you're discouraged because you failed the Lord, He offers forgiveness. Get it right with the Lord. Get it right with the Lord. Be the greatest decision you've ever made, I promise, to be saved and to live like you are saved. If you're not saved, would you come right now and get it settled? Our nation needs a revival of righteousness. People are all consumed with the election. You put anybody that's running in right now and it is not going to change this nation. I hate to burst your bubble, but let me just tell you something. Christ is the only hope. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Sin is our national disgrace. It's our national sin. We're experiencing the judgment of God. But Charlie, stop. Hey, I already showed you my granddaughter. Why do you preach what you preach? Because our only hope is repentance. He didn't say if those people get right. He said, if my people get right, I'm talking to me right now. Don't think as I preach to you that I'm not preaching to me. Holy Spirit's poking my heart all over this message about things I need to be doing. I was up this morning early confessing my sins before God. I don't walk on water. I got flesh just like you do. And we need to make sure that we get determined about the way that we walk. Some are finishing praying here. We've had one, Brother Chad, I believe, speaking to about salvation. Thank God for that. Maybe you've never seen what's called an invitation. You don't know you're going to heaven. See me right after the service. I'd be glad to talk to you. We'll have church tonight under the tent, 5.30, our last tent service. Pastor Clark will be preaching as far as I know, unless he tells me he's not. So I'm planning on him preaching tonight. You'll want to be here, I promise. All the children will be in. It's not an all-nighter. We took the lights out, so uh, we're not staying till dark. We'll be out of here. That'll start at 5.30. Don't miss it, okay? We're going to pray for our offering. If you like to give, you can give online. If you like to give it to an usher, they're standing there at the back. If you like to mail it in, great. Bring it by, great. If you have a response card, you filled it out. If you don't mind handing it to one of those guys holding a bucket, just they'll take that card from you. And uh, I'm very, very glad that God's been gracious to us this week. And we've had a tremendous, tremendous time. Those of you that came every night, your hearts are full. I know that. I've talked to so many people just feeling overwhelmed by the grace of God. If you just got in on it this morning, come back at 530. I guarantee it'd be worth it. I don't know what all you got planned, but I guarantee it won't be better than what gets preached tonight from the Word of God. Amen. And uh, that'd be a great step for you to take, all right? After, after we pray, you'll be dismissed after you speak to at least two people because we're going to follow that principle about loving the brethren, all right? Meet somebody you don't know. Just introduce yourself or say, this is not hard. Have a good day, all right? Are you ready for this? The last jab. If there's somebody here you're mad at, you're bitter at, you're angry at, 
Before you leave this property, would you track them down? Oh, they got away. No, no, no. You're thinking about them right now. If you're looking out of the corner of your eye, you're thinking about them a lot. You know where they are. You know where you need to go. You know what you need to do. Bro, it's not funny. No, it's not. <laughs> and God can help us.